مرحبا مساء الخير مساء الخير من تايوان أرحب بكم قبل أن نبدأ الجلسة مع المشتركين اليوم معنا أحب أن أوجه انتباهكم إلى وجود الترجمة الفورية اليوم فإذا لمن أحب أن يستمع إلى الحوار باللغة العربية أو باللغة الإنجليزية خاصة باللغة العربية الآن ممكن أن تنظروا إلى أسفل الشاشة فتجدون علامة على شكل كرة أرضية click on it ستجدون right? ترجمة عربية أو إنجليزية فإذا بتفضلوا تستعملوا أن تستمعوا إلى الحوار بالعربية please click on the Arabic translation all right uh, good evening everyone and welcome to today's event on translation and culture um, this event is brought to you by SOAS and the Sheikh Zayed Book Award the Sheikh Zayed Book Award is one of the world's leading prizes dedicated to Arabic literature and culture since 2006 the award has brought recognition reward and readership to outstanding work by authors, translators, publishers, and organizations around the world. In 2018, the award also launched a translation grant to help produce more quality Arabic books in translation outside the Arab world. Sawaz is of course famous for its global reach and commitment to the global South so as is a world leading center in the study of the Arab world with a high profile in cultural literary and translation studies. There will be a series of four events in April, May and June, coinciding and leading up to the award announcements in May. In these events, we will bring together creative writers, translators and researchers to talk about the role and place of Arabic culture and literature in today's ever increasing global connectedness. These events are advertised already, but you can also look them up on Sarah's website, keyword Sheikh Zayed Book Award. In today's event, we focus on translation and culture exchange starting with the idea that translators are cultural ambassadors. Together, we will think about translation, why we translate from and into which language and what and how we translate. We will also reflect on the choices we make in relation to genre, such as poetry, fiction, cookbooks, or philosophy, and our approach to translation and the style we adopt more importantly, we will think about the thrills and perils of the world of translation, the field, the market, and translation prizes, and of course, what translation can do to promote cultural exchange and global understanding. We have with us today three distinguished panelists. Let me introduce them very briefly, then let them speak for themselves. Nawal Nasrallah is a translator for the best of delectable foods and dishes from Al-Andalus and Al-Maghrib. She is shortlisted for the Sheikh, Book Zayed, uh, Sheikh Zayed Book Awards in the translation category this year. We have also Catherine Halls, a literary translator, right, and the 2021 recipient of Penn Heim Translation Fund Grant for the translation of Haytham Al-Wardani's Things that can, can't be fixed. And we have with us, right, Professor Wang Youyong, Professor of Arabic Language and Literature at the Shanghai International Studies University who translate Chinese classics into Arabic. Our events are all bilingual. We will speak in both Arabic and English, but I think Nawal, myself and Catherine will speak in English and Professor Wang will speak in Arabic. So Tariq, our translator, will be busy tonight moving between two languages. So let me now come to the format of the event. We have about 60 minutes, and if pushed, we can go beyond by about 15 minutes, right? And the format to save time, right, we'll have two rounds from our panelists. 
right? So individual panelists will make an opening statement between five and seven minutes each, right? And second round, right? Once everybody is finished, right? They will come back and respond to each other in three to five minutes. I may come in to ask questions or the speakers, the panelists can ask questions as well. And once we go through our proceedings, we'll open the floor to questions and answers. Please use the question and answer function to send in your questions uh, and we'll pick them up. I'll probably read them aloud when it comes to that. Now, before we start, right, we have so some housekeeping issues. First of all, I already explained this in Arabic, but maybe I will explain this in English again, right? There is, we, we provide simultaneous translation today and Tarek is behind the scene doing the hard work and if you want to access the event in Arabic, go down to go to the bottom of your screen and on your right, you'll see an icon with the picture of a globe underneath it, there's interpretation. Click on that and then you'll see off Arabic or English and just choose the language you wish to listen to, right? And again, please use the question and answer to ask the panelists your questions. So without further ado, let me turn to our distinguished panelists and we'll start with Nawal Nasrallah. Hi, Please thank you. Ahead. Thank you, Professor. Um, let me start by saying that uh, translation came to me as an accidental uh, uh, you know, career. Uh, when I, um, before coming to the United States in 1990, I used to be a professor at the universities of uh, Baghdad and Mosul, teaching English literature, English language. But when I came to, uh, era, uh, to the States in 1990, um, uh, of course, Iraq was in the news all the time. And people started asking me, what Iraq is eight? This is a, their way of connecting with us. So I, decided, I, I discovered that there were none. I decided to write a cookbook on the Iraqi cuisine, but um, since, of course, I have this zeal for, for research, you know, from my career, previous career, so I decided to make it half a cookbook and half history and, uh, and culture. So I dug into uh, the, uh, the archives, and to my surprise, I found that uh, um, I found uh, ancient recipes written in Akkadian on a cuneiform tablet coming back from my, my country, Iraq, in, in Babylon. They go back to 1700. Other surprises, I found that there were two Baghdadi cookbooks from the one from the 10th century and one from the 13th century. Both of them came from Baghdad. To add more to these, I discovered that other cookbooks from medieval times uh, were also written from Egypt, uh, the Levant, uh, Andalus, and of course, Al Maghrib. So I, you know, I worked on these like for six years in order to uh, write my cookbook, uh, which came as uh, uh, Delights from the Garden of Eden. Um, it took me about, you know, it's a long time to come. And then I decided after finishing this book, I decided that, that I would translate those Arabic cookbooks. And that is how my career as a translator uh, started. So why cookbooks? Because I saw in these cookbooks a wealth of uh, information on the Arab world um, during the medieval times when little was known in the West about this region during uh, this period. I thought that was a chance for me to, um, through food, through its culture, to make our Arab culture, uh, um, you know, better understood by, by the West. So I started with the, with the uh, 10th century cookbook, uh, uh, Ibn Sayyar al-Warraq, which was, uh, a huge book, 132 chapters. Not only that, not only recipes, but it's got lots of uh, poems, lots of, you know, food poetry, uh, lots of anecdotes. So I said, I will translate all these because they also reflect the, um, 
the you know the gastronomic culture, the flourishing gastronomic culture uh, at the time. So it took me a while to finish this, years to finish this, and then after that, this is the um, this is the uh, the Baghdadi uh, cookbook, 10th century. After that, I turned to Egypt because Egypt, after the uh, um, you know the decline of uh, Baghdad after the Mongol attacks, uh, Egypt became the center of the Arab world. And there was a, a book called Kenzil Fawaid, Fi Tanwi al Mawaid. Um, that was also, but it was different this time. It was only recipes. Nonetheless, it was really a valuable resource for uh, knowing about how food developed in the uh, 14th century. And it came out as a treasure trove of benefits and variety at the table. And then after that, I moved westwards and I uh, uh, translated, uh, this is my newest work, Best of Delectable Foods and Dishes. So, so far I have done three books, but they are major ones. They are huge books and they are really valuable resources on, uh, you know, on our knowledge of the Arab world. And I'm proud that I, have, I was able uh, to uh, to do this and uh, hopefully more are to come. Thank you so much, Noel. Uh, yeah, I have more questions for you later, but I'll keep that for later. <laughs> Catherine, yeah, let's turn to you now. Thanks, that's making me hungry, but I'll, I'll try and focus. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Wenjin, for inviting us and thank you to the Sheikh Zayed Book Awards for helping organise this. Um, yeah, I mean, Wenjin posed us a, an interesting set of questions to think about when we were, you know, thinking about how to introduce ourselves. And I have to admit that when I came to translation, it wasn't because I had a particular mission in mind, um, something that I wanted to discover or to bring to, to uh, Anglophone readers. I came to translation because I love the Arabic language. I studied Arabic and Hebrew at university for my undergraduate degree, and I... I'm simply in love with Semitic languages. I think they are uh, a true masterpiece of human civilization with their amazing triliteral roots and derived verb forms. Anyway, that's all a bit nerdy, um, but that's how I first kind of got involved with Arabic and began translating things. And it's, it's still really important to me because always engaging extremely closely with the text, text itself and making sure I've understood every last detail um, and that kind of technical rigor is really, really, really important to me when I translate. That's, I think, paramount. Um, but I came to translation um, in a more practical sense through uh, working on a lot of um, videos um, of um, citizen media uh, videos of the Egyptian revolution. I was helping uh, friends and comrades in Egypt subtitle them and I realize what a wonderful challenge translation is, subtitling in particular, because it's a whole technical task of its own, but, but translation, I really, I really enjoyed that. And that was how I ended up getting into translation. Um, these days I'm a translator mainly of contemporary literary fiction. And as I said, having been first just motivated by my love of language, it's only kind of over the course of my career that I've come to think more about why I translate and what I think is important about it and why I keep doing it. And I think it really gets to the heart of kind of quite big philosophical questions about the self and the other and who we are and who other people are and how we relate to them. Um, I hear, um, I often hear translators talking about the idea of, you know, introducing one culture to another or bringing, bringing sort of unknown facts and experiences about the other to Anglophone readers. And in some senses, I agree with that. I'm, that's, that's a valuable task, but I think when we're engaging with, with art and literature produced by something we see as the other, we're also finding out about ourselves. And there's something very important to me about that combination and that tension between discovering new things, discovering unfamiliar things, and recognizing also the familiar and rethinking the familiar. So that's always very important to me um, when I'm thinking about what I want to translate and when I'm even thinking about how to translate. Um, 
and I think a couple of yeah a couple of the recent projects I've I've worked on are that that's that's really been the driving force behind them um one thing I've just finished it's not published yet and I'm looking for a publisher so if you're interested get in touch is a translation of this wonderful book it's very shiny so I don't know if you can see the title it's called Mohawala Itadakur Washi um, which is by an Egyptian, well, she's a filmmaker primarily and uh, an artist called Salma Tarzi, but I also think she's an amazing, amazing writer. It's written in Egyptian vernacular. And it's about family. It's about losing a parent. It's about losing grandparents. And it's about growing up and bereavement and depression. And it's about really quite universal subjects that I think anybody can, can identify with. Certainly I have been able to. But of course, it has a very, um, very individual and very specific feel to it because it's written by somebody in Egypt and in, in that context. And I think it has this wonderful combination of, of familiar and unfamiliar, which I, which I really love in literature. Um, and another project, which I'm coming to the end of now, is the one Wen Shin mentioned in the introduction, which is a book of short stories by Haitham Wardani called Things That Can't Be Fixed, which are set between Germany and Egypt. Um, the author lives in Germany, but he comes from Egypt. And there are just, yeah, they're, they're, they have that same combination of a strange and the odd, whether that's because they come from some other country that we don't know, or whether that's because they come from perhaps um, a parallel universe. I won't give away too much, but there's, there, there are strange goings on in all of his stories. And also they're very familiar, you know, Berlin. I live in Berlin, so there's a lot of the, the, dreary, the dreary Berlin <laughs> cityscape. And, and I love that combination. Um, I suppose, yeah, when it, I suppose we, we may talk about, about, about this a little bit more later, but some of the things I, that really matter to me in translation as a field are that rigor that I talked about earlier, technical rigor. I think um, there's a bit of a kind of often fruitless debate that goes on about the tension between something being technically right and also being a literary, good literary pro product in its own right. Um, you may recall the kind of furore over um, Deborah Smith's translation of Han Kang's The Vegetarian, which won this, you know, extremely prestigious prize. And yet there were a lot of people saying that she'd made so many mistakes in translation from the Korean. And, I, you know, I feel I can talk about this with some kind of distance because I know nothing about Korean as a language, you know, Korean language or Korean literature. But, but that was... Yeah, I think a somewhat fruitless debate because a good translation has to be both of these things, doesn't it? It has to be technically right. You can't have mistakes. And yet it also has to be this, this good literary product in its own right, which makes, which makes translation quite a unique art form, I think. Um, and yeah, that's one of the things that makes it such a challenging and always stimulating job. I'll leave it there for now and perhaps we'll return to some of these subjects. You have a second round, right? So you will have, we'll, you will all come back and then uh, talk more. We'll get into when, the nitty gritty then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get to, and I'll have questions to ask you as well. If, you know, if you stop and I feel that I want to hear more. والآن إلى الدكتور وان الذي سيتحدث باللغة العربية عن ترجمته العربية من الصينية وخاصة الكتب الكلاسية بالصينية. Hi. Assalamu alaikum. You are a Hadur al Karam, Ismahadi and Usharekum B. PPT. Okay. Yani, if you had him on a Saba, I will read on Abir and Shukri Jazil, Ila Jazet and Sheikh Zaid, Lila Lil Kitab, or Kazel Jamat Soas. بالنسبة للعلاقة بين الترجمة والثقافة أعتقد أن لا توجد ثقافة بدون من دون ترجمة ولا توجد ترجمة من دون ثقافة فهما كالجسد وروح فثقافة هي قلب الترجمة واللبه الفائل ولذلك يعني بدأت أترجم الكلاسيكيات الصينية وترجمة الكلاسيكيات الصينية ترجمة ثقافية إلى حد كبير وهي تشتمل على ترجمة داخل اللغة واحد والترجمة من لغة إلى أخرى إذ كانت الكلاسيكية الصينية مكتوبة باللغة الصينية القديمة فتحتاج ترجمتها إلى نقلها بداية 
من الصينية القديمة إلى الصينية الحديثة قبل نقلها إلى الصينية الحديثة إلى اللغة العربية الحديثة وهذا يعني قد يؤدي إلى إفقادها بعد مما كانت تتفرد به من التلالات والأوزان والإيقاعات والأساليب يعني بدأت أترجم الكلاسيكيات الصينية إلى العربية قبل عشر سنوات يعني بعد أن تعلمت اللغة العربية أكثر من 30 سنة يعني في في عام 1985 وتعاونت مع مؤسسة فيك عربي وهذه المؤسسة قد أسترت لي أربع الكتب الكلاسيكية وهي شينزي وليزي وأحاديث عن جذور الحكمة ومسامرات بجوار الموقف إن شاء الله يعني سوف تصدر لي الكتاب الخامس وهي هافيزي في عام في هذا العام عام 2022 يعني اما كتاب شينتي فهو يعني فشينتي هو فيلسوف صيني القديم هو بادر لاول مره في التاريخ الصيني القول بالطبع الشرير للانسان. وهذا يختلف عن مانشوس الذي امن بالطبع الخير للانسان. وهو داعيا الى صحر الاداب والقوانين في بوتقه واحده والى ايماء احتمام بالغ بتحذيب الخلقي والعقاب القانوني وهذا يعني الجمله ماخوذه من هذا الكتاب مثل من يعد من يعد ما هو صائب صائبا وما هو خاطئ خاطئا هو عاقل ومن يعد ما هو خاطئ صائبا وما هو صائب خاطئا هو جاهل نعم و والكتاب الثاني هو كتاب ليتسي يعني والليتسي هو فيلسوف شهير في عصر الممالك المتحركة الصينية وأول مفكر يدعو إلى نظرية المراحل الأربع للنشأة الكون وأول أديب يجمع بين أسطورة والحكمة في عصر ما قبل أسرة تشين الملكية وأيضا هناك جملة أو عبارات مأخوذة من هذا الكتاب أعمى قول لا يقال وأسمى فعل لا يفعل بفعل ومن يساير عصره يزدهر ومن يخالف عصره ينتثر اما الكتاب الكتاب الثالث فهو كتاب احاديث عن جذور الحكمه وبقلم الفيلسوف الصيني هون يين مين وهذا الكتاب يضم مجموعه كبيره من الاقوال الماثوره وهذه الاقوال الماثوره تتناول كيفيه تحذيب النفس ومعاشره الناس ومعالجه الامور وتبادل تعامل مع العالم ومنها بعض العبارات مثلا حينما لا تعنيك عزه والذله ستغدو هاديا في مشاهده تفتح الازهار وسقودها امام الفناء وحينما لا يهمك الرحيل والبقاء سيغدو ستغدو دائما هائما في متابعه انقباض السحب او انبساطها فوق السماء هذا هو الكتاب الذي احاديث عن جذور الحكمه اما الكتاب الرابع فهو يعني مسامرات بجوار الموقف يعني وهذا الكتاب هو يضم 221 حكمه وتدور موضوعاتها حول الانسان واستقراره وامنها وحول الوجود برمته ومنها طيب سوف اتربك مثلا من هذا الجمله من هذه ماخوذه من هذا الكتاب لا يمكن الإنسان ألا يحمل دموحات عظيمة فإن لم يكن دموحا فسيغدو ملوثا بما هو وحيد وملطخا بما هو وسخ حتى لا تتحقق له آية إنجازات أية إنجازات ولا يمكن للإنسان أن يحمل أطماعا كبيرة فإن كان طماعا فسيغدو He will let go of all what's close to him, running after to all what's distant. So don't expect any successes out of such a person. As for the fifth book that has not been uh, printed or published yet, and I will share with you some of the quotes from this book, like what does not last will not last and what's empty will not live longer it's not smart for a person to talk about what they don't know nor a loyal who keeps what they know from others this is some of the most famous quotations from the 
and wise sayings from the warring states era. And he is the uh, most prominent uh, speaker uh, from uh, the, for the legal uh, school uh, way of thought. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And looking forward to our second session. And we will continue our talk. Thank you very much again. Shukran Jazil and uh, Dr. Wang. So we, we come now to our round two. So we go back to Nawal now that all of you have listened to each other. I wonder whether, you know, what you have said, right, triggered anything. So we go back to, we go to round two and we return to Nawal. So if Nawal, if there's a comeback from you or addition from you. Unmute, unmute yourself, you're muted. Okay. First of all, I, I'm interested in asking uh, Yang Wong about the, he mentioned that uh, uh, classical uh, Chinese is different from modern Chinese. And uh, in order to translate it into Arabic, he had to translate the, uh, they had, he had to use, did he use the, uh, the Arabic modernized, uh, the Chinese modernized version in order to uh, um, translate the Chinese? I'm asking because in Arabic, we have a different case. Um, Arabic language did not change much from medieval times and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, the standard Arabic nowadays we use today. I mean, it changed uh, uh, regarding vocabulary, regarding, you know, of course, with the changes of times. But basically, um, I can easily read uh, like uh, 10th century, 9th century manuscripts into, I mean, and they read perfectly or right to me. I mean, it, it didn't uh, change that much. So I'm interested in knowing about the situation in China. How was it uh, like? I mean, is it like English, for example? Um, Chaucer, for example, he wrote in the 14th century, but I don't understand it. I have to read it, translate it into, uh, uh, you know, modern English. So I, I'd like him to elaborate on this uh, uh, language uh, uh, issue. I will, yeah, I will save him for later. But, you know, Nawal, is there anything else that you would like to add to what you had said earlier? Yeah, well... Uh, yeah, I realized that I was, uh, you know, too brief in my presentation. Um, the three books I translated, I consider them a wealth. They have sources for wealth of information on the, uh, that important period in the Arab world. Um, uh, the translating them into English, by translating them into English, I tried to fill a gap in the knowledge in the Western world of what happened during um, between, uh, you know, uh, the antiquity, times of antiquity and uh, after, let's say, 14th, 15th uh, century. Um, the, um, in the West world, they noticed that there are certain, uh, the, the European cuisine started to use uh, certain ingredients like rose water, uh, lots of sugar and uh, uh, saffron, and these are all, you know, Arab uh, uh, ingredients. So how come they, they feature in those uh, European uh, uh, cookbooks? And uh, before translating those books, before, you know, uh, having really concrete uh, evidence of what happened during uh, the, the, from the period of 9th and uh, 14th century in the Arab world, they didn't have, they didn't, couldn't stand in their discussions, they couldn't stand on firm grounds on what uh, uh, really happened. But here we have in those books, like primary sources, they are the, you know, here you have recipes uh, using those ingredients. There is a, 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 you know, a concrete evidence of, of uh, what happened and how this happened. Uh, the speculation is that the influence between uh, the influence of the Arab world on the uh, Western uh, medieval Western cuisine happened through uh, two venues, either the, through the Crusaders or through the uh, eight uh, centuries of, uh, uh, of uh, Arab stay in, uh, in Al-Andalus. Both ways, of course, they had their, uh, uh, their uh, venues in order to uh, you know, uh, transmit 
this uh, uh, culinary uh, uh, tradition from uh, east uh, uh, to west. But I think that uh, uh, Al-Andalus, during those eight centuries, it played a really uh, 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 an, a significant role in the transmission of this uh, information. And that's why I find that the last book I translated, Best of Delectable Foods of Dishes, uh, I find it very important because it was written in the 13th century. It's um, a well-written book. It's a, a huge book, very well organized. And um, you can easily see, you know, what was cooking at the time and the things that were uh, transmitted. Um, I have an issue with indirect translations. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they, you lose so much. I mean, we, t we talk about lost in translation, which is true. Uh, because I know from what happened in medieval times, um, for example, books on uh, dietetics by physicians like Ibn Jazla, Ibn Butlan, uh, their books were important. And the Western uh, world realized their importance for specialists and for the laymen. What happened was they had to translate them, first of all, into Latin. Other countries, European countries, wanted to also know about them. So from Latin, for example, to German. And if you compare the Latin with the German, you see that uh, they didn't really get the, you know, uh, full benefit of those uh, wonderful books. That's why to me, primary sources like those cookbooks, they are important. Um, they also, you know, uh, give us also a knowledge, firm knowledge on, on Arabic cuisine. I mean, I, I don't really also, uh, I mean, I, I mean it is, they, were, they are beneficial to uh, the Western research, but they are also important for us as Arabs. Um, because uh, they give us, uh, you know, uh, really a, a full image of what happened and how things developed, because now we are pra all practicing Arabic cuisine. How did we get it? How did it develop? We go to those primary sources from different parts of the Arab world, uh, from Baghdad, Egypt, and uh, from uh, Morocco, Al-Andalus, and we see what continued, what discontinued, and, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Even there are things I didn't know, you know, I discovered when, while, while, uh, mm -hmm. while doing mm -hmm. these. For example, you know, I'm really thrilled about this uh, Morocco, this Andalusi cookbook, because in it you find the, uh, the beginning, you know, the, uh, the dish, we say they, 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 in Morocco, it's Bastille, 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 or they call it Bastille. Um, it's really uh, a big thing in North Africa. But there, in the 13th century, we have a, a, a recipe that describes how this dish was, how this dish was made. And in another uh, Andalusi cookbook, it was called Umm al-Faraj. That is the mother of happy endings. Uh, I think, this is my theory, I think they call it the mother of happy endings because it is such a difficult dish. I mean, it's, it's really a pain in the neck. But then after... <laughs> Cooking this dish, there you go. You have a bundle of joy. That's why they called it, you know, the mother of happy endings. So all these discovers, you know, you make, they are the things that keep you going. And, you know, you know, it's not, not easy work, but it keeps you going. Another thing I discovered, and I was thrilled when I did my, uh, my Egyptian cookbook, The Treasure Trove. Had I not translated this book, I would have missed something very important which is a, a certain tool that is mentioned only in one, in one manuscript, and it is called, they call it mifrak. From what I understood is that it was used like the, today's we use the, uh, this, you know, the, uh, this uh, stand uh, uh, blender. Uh, and I discovered that there was something used in Egypt going back to uh, the Roman times, and there is a picture of it. I mean, I saw a picture of it uh, in, the, in the Alexandrian and in, in the museum in Alexandria. When I probed into this uh, subject even further, I discovered that the same tool is still being used in uh, Southern Egypt 
in, the, in, the, in, in Sudan, and they also call it mifrak. So I was so fascinated that my husband made for me the, the mifrak. <laughs> <laughs> the way they use it is that they do this like this, you know, in the, in the dishes and they, and they blend them. This tells us really, you know, this is uh, tells us something that if something is good, it works, it stays. So, uh, you know, you get so many lessons when you read those books, but you have to pay attention. You have to be patient. If, if I hadn't translated this book, I wouldn't have discovered uh, this. Another thing, those cookbooks are also important in that uh, they, I mean, we, we read, for example, in Al-Mas'udi, so many stories or al ghani about food, about uh, dishes they mention. Um, up until the 80s, before the beginning of the editing of those Arabic books, we didn't know whether they, these were exaggerations. Were they true? Did this really thing happen? For example, I read the, um, in Al-Mas'udi uh, about a dish that cost a thousand dirhams. It was made by, uh, with fish tongues. And it was the uh, it was the, uh, the favorite dish of uh, Harun al Rashid's half brother Ibrahim bin Al Mahdi, who was a, a you know he was a, a, a gastronomic uh, you know uh, authority at the time. And I found in the 10th century cookbook, you know, like by Ibn Sayyar al Warraq, a recipe which is like aspic and uses. Tons of fishes, lots of them, and it is said that it was the favorite of Ibrahim bin Al Mahdi. So, I mean, we have to, uh, you know, they also, this, this is another function for those recipes. They also confirm, or, you know, uh, I mean, they, they, they tell us whether, I mean, we can tell whether those uh, stories were, uh, you know, were uh, exaggerated or they were based on uh, things that really happened which I think, which I rather, uh, you know, think that they were, you know, they were not really uh, mere exaggerations or the, the product of their uh, imagination. Because in the Moroccan, uh, in the Andalusi book I translated, in my research, for example, I read, Ibn Khaldun, for example, said that the diet of the Andalusis, the urbanites among them, uh, that was mostly, um, made with uh, chicken and lamb. And I think, I mean, I believe this because in this chapter, in the, in the chapters on, uh, on, on uh, mutton and lamb and uh, in the chicken chapter, we have more than uh, in each, more than 40 recipes of, uh, uh, of chicken and, uh, you know, uh, lamb. So we have, we've got to believe uh, what they say. Also, another thing, uh, there were, they, also that we read in the books that there was uh, somebody made, uh, you know, ha held a, a party in which nothing served but chicken, but, you know, chicken dishes, lots of them. And, of course, I mean, with that many dishes you find in al Tujibi in al Tujibi's book, I mean, you, you, you've got to believe them. So... Um, I mean, there's no end to the benefits of those uh, of those books. Great, thank you, Noel. Yeah, let's turn to Catherine now. Where's <laughs> the second wind? I'm amazed. I didn't even know fish had tongues. So I learned <laughs> something very interesting today. Thank you, Noel. Well, that was so interesting. Oh, okay. um, just a couple of reflections on what both of you have said, both of my co-panelists. Um, I'm very interested in in the kind of historical. Uh, aspects of what you do as you know the translation process that you both have to go through as your work and 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 I share Nawaz's um, interest in the challenges of translating from old Chinese um, Yu Yang so I'd, I'd be really interested to hear more about that um, and I think Nawal in your case it I mean I imagine there must be quite a lot of more practical translation, if I can call it that, involved in things like working out what measurements are and so on. Like if they say, I don't know, you know, I give you a currency for you know one dirham's worth of this or whatever, then I suppose you have to work out what on earth that was worth and how much uh, that translates into as a quantity of the ingredients. So I'm really curious as to how yeah. you go about okay. doing that and whether or not you actually try your recipes because yeah. that seems to me like um, a really interesting. Yeah. 
kind okay. of translation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, to begin with, I mean, uh, up until no, Noah, no, no, sorry, sorry. Can we sort of like let Catherine finish and then come okay. back to you to answer okay. these questions? Okay. Like, yeah. let, let, let me sort of like do this so that uh, Dr. Wang would have some time to yeah, okay. talk as well. Yeah, Catherine? I was also reflecting as you were both speaking on, um, you know, I think you're obviously both e extremely invested in translating a very specific genre and a specific body of knowledge, which is really, really interesting. And I'm curious as to the motives for doing that. I, I can imagine that one motive might be to showcase what is a simply um, uh, brilliant and interesting culture in its own right, whether it's, you know, the cuisine of the medieval Islamic world or, you know, the philosophy of, of the Chinese classics. And I'm interested, is that a big part of why you do it? Is there also an interest in, you know, this body of knowledge as something to learn from and something that's relevant to us today? Um, because some of those words of wisdom, Professor Wang, I wonder if, if you see them as something that, you know, could give us, um, yeah, things to reflect on in, in modern life, whether it's, you know, us reading them or, or, or people who read them in Arabic. Um, and Noel, I noticed that you're, uh, you know, with your interest in these very, very practical things like this implement used, uh, <laughs> used in your cookbooks you know are you are you interested in in how the people of the past lived and what what that can tell us and yeah I'm curious about that that kind of motive um I've I've done some historical translation myself um a little bit less recently but um um some of the academic work that I was doing during my studies involved looking at um, the writings of uh, Jews in Arabic, and I've translated, translated a, fair, a fair bit of stuff by Abu Nadara, who was um, an Egyptian nationalist. Um, he was Jewish, and he wrote primarily in Arabic, but he also appears to have written in Italian and French. He was, I guess he was a polymath and a real character. And yeah, a, a couple of other Jewish writers also of Arabic. And I think... Um, on the one hand, that's interesting as a body of literature because it's simply great writing. I mean, Abu Nadara is is funny. He's a caricaturist as well. He's not. It's 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 cartoons accompanied by text and poetry and captions and and speech bubbles. And it's I mean, it's wonderful to read, but it's also um, uh, it's also a glimpse of a very different time when. Um, things were very different in the Middle East and it was perfectly normal for Jews to speak and write in Arabic. And I think that is something that we can learn from in itself. Um, so, so for me, there's that, that double motive of, you know, showcasing this wonderful body of literature, but also thinking about what we can learn from this time gone by and the way that these people used to write. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it, leave it there for now because I've asked so many questions. <laughs> okay, so Noel, hold, hold your thoughts. I'll turn to Dr. Wang, right, for his few words, right, and please, you know, respond. It looks like uh, uh, Okay, thank you very much for this question that has been that I have been tasked to answer by Dr. Nawal and Ms. Catherine. In truth, this is a question that 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 most that all translators are keen to know more about, whether from the Chinese side or the Arabic one, it, because these classics, as I have said and mentioned before, are written in ancient Chinese. So we don't have any basis in the ancient Chinese, and we cannot express their way, their their unique way in this very short sayings, keeping it short. Just like the Arabic saying, the best talk is what is short and direct to the meaning. So how can we express these Chinese classics in their own way and their own exceptional writing skills? This is the great challenge that faces all translators, whether from the Chinese side 
or the Arabic one. As for the Arabic one, when I translate Chinese classics, I always review the explanations, the descriptions of these classics, the, the explanations, the interpretations of these ancient Chinese and uh, in modern Chinese in order for me to understand them, to grasp their meaning. However, when I pick the words, I have to choose according according to the ancient Chinese texts and not according to the modern one, the contemporary one. Because if we are translating Chinese classics in, 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 with, or rather in modern Chinese, this, this will lead to a loss and to prolong things which was not uh, something that the ancient Chinese texts were keen on having, they averted it. So we're trying to keep things short according to the ancient language. So how can we strengthen our roots in ancient Chinese? We Chinese people, we read poems and, uh, and ancient uh, Chinese texts to establish ourselves in ancient Chinese first. Since our early childhood, from, from elementary school, and we uh, recite, uh, we memorize uh, poems, just like Arabs do with their poetry, in order to express in, with less words in a more refined manner, with, that gives more meaning. So this is the challenge. The first challenge in translating Chinese classics. So this question takes me to another one, leads me to another one. Who's going to translate into Chinese classics? As I think, a Chinese translator should should choose should pick classics. However, they, he has to collaborate and keenly between a Chinese, uh, the, the Chinese translator and the uh, Arabic editor or reviewer to be in a way that is uh, attractive to Arab, uh, to the Arab audience and to transfer these uh, Chinese classics, these Chinese philosophy into the Arab audience in the right manner in a way that attracts and it's close to the hearts of the Arab readers. This is what I wanted to talk. I wanted to talk about these two issues or topics. Who's translating Chinese classics and what are the challenges that they're facing, that we face in translating these Chinese classics? I hope that I was, that my answer was convincing and fulfilling. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you sort of like uh, open this sort of Q&A to the audience. Uh, uh, Nawal, you wanted to answer Catherine's questions and then please go ahead while I think about how to bring all of you together, right? So just go ahead, Nawal, if you want to. Well, Catherine, you asked me about, uh, well, amounts and the equivalence in modern, uh, uh, you know, in modern usage. Well, let me begin by like, saying that up until the uh, mid, 20th century or something, we all cooked by, uh, the, by, 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 by what they say, we say uh, eye measurement. I mean, we just, uh, we don't use measurements. And most of the recipes in those books, uh, they depended on, um, on the knowledge of the cook, on the eye measurements, but they also, uh, in some of the recipes, we have exact measurements. Um, and, uh, I, and for uh, giving equivalence, which I, I did, I mean, wherever there are measurements in those books, between brackets, I give the equivalence in pounds, in ounces, in grams, because I want to give uh, the reader an idea of the proportions. This is important for, consist for the consistency, the resulting consistency of the dish. There are uh, sources that discuss how much 
uh, is, for example, uh, Qirat, how much is a uh, Ratil, and how much it was in that time. So I used those uh, tables in order to make uh, those equivalents. It wasn't really that difficult because uh, that was uh, an important matter in the Muslim world, or how much the, for example, people during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, how much was it worth? Because, you know, when they, uh, they had to, you know, uh, to give exact measurements and uh, to emulate the, for example, the ways of the, uh, the, the ways the, the, that was, that were done during the, the time. Um, the other question was, uh, what was it? The motive? My motive. motive was, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. My motive. The values to... about reading, reading things from the distant past and knowing how people yeah, lived yeah, a long yeah. time ago. Yeah. Well, um, when I read those books, of course, uh, I was blown away, so to speak, by the, all the information uh, I found there, by the similarities, um, you know, by, and I, I, I became really quite convinced that the, uh, of the continuity of uh, the, uh, the, you know, of the Arabic cuisine, especially in Iraq, because now I know how we cook things. I know how things were cooked during the Babylonian times from those Babylonian, you know, ancient recipes. And I have two books from Baghdad cooking those dishes. And I was able to see, you know, the uh, progression of the cuisine in the same region, uh, which you do not find, you know, at, this is, was really a, a rare chance for me, which you do not find in other, in the discussion of the cuisines of uh, uh, other uh, cultures. And what motivated me also was uh, because, you know, I, 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 I read about the, uh, you know, the food studies, about uh, the, uh, the new uh, research on medieval times, whether in Al-Andalus, whether in the Levant, Iraq. And I see that there are certain things that were misunderstood. Because, of course, that was due to lack of information. Uh, for example, um, in one of the, uh, a small book by al-Baghdadi, the 13th century, was translated by Orientalist Arbery. Uh, but there was a, a, a dish that we do not, a, a condiment we do not use nowadays. It is murri, which is the equivalent of uh, fish sauce, in, uh, for example, in Southeast Asia or the soy sauce in, in China. It was a very laborious thing that we know very little about until we got, of course, other recipes in, in, the, in the rest of the books. So Arbery, of course, I don't blame him. He translated something called budanej as he thought it was fudanej, which was a penny royal, a kind of mint. So the resulting recipe, for example, he gave to, to, to generations of readers, he gave the impression that this uh, fermented sauce was made with mint and other things, which in fact it was not. Pudanaj was uh, rotted bread. They mm -hmm. made, it was fish, it was not fish based, it was not uh, soybeans based, it was cereal based, this uh, fermented sauce. In order to uh, begin the fermentation, they had to, uh, to prepare dough and, uh, uh, and uh, make and, and, and cause it to rot. They keep it for 40 days. They wrap the, this dough in uh, fig leaves and they cover them until they rot. And they use this part in order to make the, the, the fermented sauce. So I thought, I mean, he gave generations of readers the, the, the wrong impression. This is the danger, you know, of not interpreting things the, the, the right way. I mean, it's not might, going might to have led to food poisoning, right? Might, might have led to food poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have so, to be so, careful. So, so sort of, yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let me sort of try to sort of make links. And today we're talking about translation and cultural exchange and so on and so forth. So I'm going to sort of like... Uh, pulling all, you know, while we wait for the audience to write up their questions, I'm going to share with you an anecdote and an idea. Okay. So as a child who grew up in Libya, right, I had fried birds, right, cooked birds, roast birds, and so on and so forth, never had, had in Libyan cuisine birds cooked in bream. So I thought that was... Cooked, cooked where? Cooked where? In bream, bream, in, in yeah. soup, right, in bream, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. 
um, it, it came with this. So, so for that, I went to sort of like Nanjing for a conference and I was there and, you know, Nanjing is famous for its duck hooked in bring, xian shui ya in Chinese, right? And what was sort of my host said, you know, well, come, you know, you would like this. And, you know, and he found that I was interested in cuisines, in semiotics of food and in Islam and in the Arab world. And he said, oh, you didn't know this, this dish, xian shui ya? is brought to China by the Muslims. I said, what? <laughs> Arabs, no such thing. So Nawal, I went to your cook, the cookbook you translated, Matbakh al-Khalifa or al-Khulafa, I found the recipes. Right? Oh, which one? Which one was it? Which one was it? Uh, they're, they're all of them, different yeah. ones. When yeah. you have the pot, you, you, you the soup, you water, and then you, you put- Oh, you stews, know, yeah, stews, yeah, stews, yeah. Not stews, right? You just dip the bird in very yeah. quickly. You take it out, cut it, and then you put oh. sort of condiment garnishes on it. That's so this is like- That's yeah. 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 So it, it is a sleep, yeah. So it is you know? Yeah. Yeah, the cuisine, you know, this kind of That's, cuisine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? And, yeah. They, and then in time, we forget about them. And I come to Catherine's questions, right? Are we interested in why are we interested in reading about the past? And I want to come back to this idea that all of you brought to, to the foreground today. And I want to use the word adab in Arabic and win in Chinese to think about it, right? So adab, ummahat al kutub al siniya, ummahat al kutub al arabiya, these all belong to this category of win and adab. And these two categories include poetry, history, fiction story, storytelling, aesthetics, and ethics all together. So this, these two categories, and what we, I see here is this conversation, right, among you, but also among the different parts of our literary culture, if I can say it this way. And I want to come to you, Nawal, and ask you about the relationship between the ethics of health, of maintaining health and cuisine, which is a huge part of cookbooks, right? Yeah. It's not yeah. like the kind of political war we get in about hummus and falafel, yeah. but it's really about that. But also when Ibn Butlan writes in Da'wat al-Atibba, yes. he's having fun. It's aesthetic, it's literary, and that's yeah. what Catherine is concerned with, right? But it is also philosophical. It's ethics of everyday living that Professor Wang is telling us about in Ummahat al Kutub al Siniya, in the classic Chinese classics. So, can we have some comments about this and about sort of how um, these cultures, classical, modern, Chinese, and Arabic, bring us together to an area where we can think about? something called global humanities, which is a topic we will address in our event number four. Yeah, and, and the interest, all our interest in that while I wait for questions from the audience. Yeah, shall we? Sure. So, yeah, Noel, you, you, you're enthusiastic. Let's start with you. <laughs> well, let me give the chance to others when I, I speak till uh, later. Yeah. You will speak last? Okay, maybe we'll reverse the order, Dr. Wang, yeah? Your intervention about the relationship between Chinese culture and the Arabic one through contemplating about Arabic culture and when uh, Chinese culture, uh, basically uh, culture or literature between Arabic and exchanging thoughts, Tawarud al-Khawatir, for example, exchanging thoughts. It's a relationship between Chinese classics and Arabic literary classics, right? What is your question again, please? The question was not clear to me. The question was not clear. I'll repeat it. I'll, I'll try. I forgot my own question. I would like to connect and bridge the gap between the three intervention, between yours, Noel's, and Catherine's. 
through connecting these three uh, interventions through the concept of Arabic literature and Chinese win, Chinese literature. We find in win and in Arabic literature, in both of them, we find books or uh, texts that are philosophical in nature, cultural, civilized, uh, artistic, literary, and all of them artistic. And all of them, uh, they answer th topics that are not just uh, artistic in nature, but also philosophic and ethical and health-wise in, in, yeah, to be, to take care of your uh, health as part of your daily ethics, your daily way of being. Could you give us your own remarks on, on, the uh, on what's similar between uh, Chinese philosophy or wisdom? I I think I, it's it's better to call them wisdoms, Chinese wisdom and Arabic wisdom. So this compatibility between the two. In truth, but Chinese uh, culture is quite keen on combining or on the relationship between a human being, his society, and nature. As for literature, this is a, a, a word of utmost importance in Chinese culture, whether it was in, in Chinese classics. So, when we are talking here about philosophy, we always combine philosophy with literature or we express a certain philosophical idea in a literary manner as well as when we eat whether it's breakfast lunch or dinner we are keen and we give importance to the color and the shape and the way it looks of course, and taste as well to these Chinese uh, dishes. So it's not just taste, but but we are also keen on the way it's presented. Sometimes we we make a flower shape or a type of bird. We make a type of bird, a shape of bird, on the table so that uh, people on that table would enjoy enjoy it through eyesight just as much through their tongues so we enjoy both its taste and its looks which indicates that Chinese culture is quite keen on combining both philosophy thoughts and literature as for literature since uh, uh, the earliest times China, China just like uh, just like the Arabic nature a nation has uh, poetry just like Arabs were keen on poetry we have a book on songs that was before the Qi uh, dynasty which has various different types of literature that develop and evolve from one uh, age to another and diversify. And at the same time, we we uh, we we uh, take from Arabic literature, just like Mr. Bassam, in the fourth event, he, in the upcoming fourth event, he has translated many Arabic works into Chinese, like Jibran Khalil Jibran's works, as well as poems, Mahmoud Darwish's poems. So, we academics, we are very keen on transferring culture, uh, Arabic culture and Arabic uh, art and literature into Chinese, which means that there's this rich uh, exchange between the two cultures and we benefit from one another. Thank you very much. Shukran laka. Catherine. Catherine, reverse going, order. You're still yeah. in the middle. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to very much echo 
uh, what Yu Yong has said there, I think, although I'm going to answer your question in a slightly roundabout way. Um, I, I'd like to just return to what um, Yu Yong said in his last intervention about the importance of working with an Arabic language editor when he's translating from Chinese. I think this is something that we often forget about translation. There's an image of the translator who sits alone, surrounded by books in their library, their dictionaries. Um, but of course, translation is always collaborative. I often find that in my work, I'm always bringing up friends to ask them what things mean or to ask them how they interpret things because in the end, translators are readers and we have our own interpretations. I'm interested in thinking about other people's, other readers' interpretations as well as my own. Um, and, you know, sadly, I think in the Anglophone, in Anglophone publishing, there isn't enough of an appreciation of how important, important it is to have editors who are specialized in editing translations and who can do so with reference to the original Arabic. Um, that's something I'd love to see a lot more of. And, and mm. I think that would help very much in helping cement um, uh, rigor, you know, a, a kind of standard of, of good, good standards of rigor within uh, the publishing of translations from Arabic. But translation is collaborative. That's one thing. Um, and the, 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 the other thing that, that translation is, is a, um, I suppose a constant, a constant striving for, for perfection that might possibly never arrive. And um, Nawal didn't mention this today, but we met a couple of days ago just to test Zoom and so on. And she was telling us about um, some recipes which called for fish as an ingredient, but didn't say what kind of fish it was. And I thought this idea of a mystery fish was just such a wonderful metaphor for something that we all come across in translation, which is these, these things that you just can't quite work out. And these things that, that, you know, remain, remain so out, remain out of reach somehow. And I think that's, so often an experience, I've had it in, you know, I, I wouldn't claim any of my translations are perfect. There are always things I haven't quite managed to get my head around. So translation is always collaborative. Translation is always exploratory. Um, and Creative, sort of, right? Yeah, Creative, absolutely. Right? Mm. Of course. And if I come back now to the idea of global humanities, that's not a, a term I tend to um, particularly think of my work as being involved in. But I, I would say that the same is true of our humanity. Um, that it's collaborative, that it's exploratory, that it's creative. Um, and this is why I'm, I'm so interested in, in reading and engaging with the writings of others, be they, you know, in my case, I translate uh, writings that come from perhaps uh, a different place, perhaps simply a different language community. Um, many of the writers whose work uh, I translate actually live in the same city as me. So they're not such geographical others. They just happen to use a different language of expression. But, you know, um, Noel and Yu Yong both translate the writings of historical others as well. And I think that I would go so far as to say that our, our humanity is incomplete when we don't engage with the thoughts and the artistic products of those others or when we treat them merely as, as curios. Um, to be just kind of looked at as something that's different. Um, so that's that's my thought on your question of humanities and, and humanity. Yeah, thank you so much. Catherine, uh, before I let you have the miskil kritam nawal, I'm going to read to you a comment from one of our guests uh, who is attending from China, Eileen Chen, right? I have one comment for Nawal. Philippe Hetti also included that fish tongue anecdote in his history, an unforgettable story. In the Chinese tradition, fish whiskers very are very comparable, are said to be an utmost delicacy. The eras of your translation, the 10th century of Baghdad one and the 13th century of Andalusian one and the 14th century of the Kyrian one, actually were the golden ages of each one of the different areas of the Islamic world. We as readers and researchers of medieval times, thank you so much for your continuous efforts in making these delicious, delicious <laughs> translations. <laughs> that right. that right. makes my day. Lucky miskil khitam. Yeah, of course, before I thank everyone, lucky miskil khitam. 
Well, you talked about, uh, you know, humanities in the world, and I would like to uh, comment on the uh, transmission of, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, of this culture, of those, uh, you know, uh, ideas among the nations. And of course, uh, um, you know, with, in, as regards, you know, my uh, specialty, I can see this, you know, those cuisines as, uh, you know, being transmitted from one region to the other. It's interesting to see how they develop, you know, as they, uh, you know, the, the, as they migrate to other places and, you know, settle there and then and, and, and develop. But um, you talked about um, uh, Chinese uh, dishes you found similar to al warraq which I don't find surprising because um, we know that the Arab cuisine during medieval times, like uh, 14th century or something, during the Mughals, uh, there are certain dishes that you find during that period, uh, they transmitted, they were through the Mughals, they translated to, they tran uh, whether they were transmitted to uh, India and also uh, to uh, China when they were, you know, ruled by the Mughals. Uh, there is this book, uh, uh, A Soup for the Khan. Uh, it's, it's a translation of a, a Chinese uh, book on, uh, uh, ancient book on dietetics and proper eating. And uh, there are recipes, in fact, that, uh, that are similar to the 13th century, uh, you know, Baghdadi uh, cookbook. So there is always this influence, you know, to and fro, you know, from, uh, from those places. And uh, those, I think, those, uh, you know, basic, um, you know, resources we are providing through translation, all of us, they help us you know, in uh, deciphering all those movements, you know, among uh, cultures. And, uh, mm. you know, I think they are really essential. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for gracing us with your presence and for your contributions and for your delicious discourses. Uh, <laughs> the event is recorded for those of you who want to listen to this or who want to sort of circulate it, it's recorded but I don't know how it's going to be disseminated, but I'm sure someone will give you an answer. So let's us all together thank our distinguished panelists again for sharing their thoughts, their practices, and more importantly, their translations across regions, cultures, languages, and times. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for hosting us. Thank you, Professor Liang. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. And thank you both.